Spineless Spinelli Robert De Niro Spinelli took the stand for two days to talk about his part in everything Korea, the Meldish murder, Sean Richard, and many other topics as well. No matter what his role was, Spinelli took pride in everything he did, whether it was lying for the government or stealing from the government. He played his part. Not even a minute into his questioning, and Spinelli was already telling lies when Rothman asked him the following. How far did you go in school? Twelfth grade. The first thing we have to ask is what happened to his degree from Rutgers? Was he lying in New Jersey? Or is he lying in New York? Does he even know what a lie is? Or is that his general state of being? Liar 24-7. And while it might not seem that lying about a college education would be a big deal, he didn't lie about it on a job application or while boasting to a friend. He lied about it in a document to a court of law. That kind of lying is a bit more serious, especially when telling the truth is part of a cooperation agreement. Remember, that New Jersey incident resolved only two months before the start of this trial, and it wasn't in his favor. When Spinelli was sent to prison for his attempted murder conviction, he was housed with Vic Amuso, the alleged boss of the Lucchese family, in Big Sandy, Kentucky. When he arrived there a year before his release, he had asked to be roomed with Amuso, who supposedly knew of him from the Capazzolo murder attempt. Later, Spinelli learned about Matthew Madonna, who Amuso said was the acting boss of the family. Before Spinelli got into the details about his involvement with Madonna and what caused his seething hatred that he became an informant to get back at Matty, he talked about meeting Michael Meldish and James Mafucci at a Cuban restaurant in Harlem in January 2012. He also met Terence Caldwell. What's strange about his testimony is this when questioned by Rothman. Okay, who were you with when you met Mr. Caldwell? I was with Jimmy Mafucci and Mikey. When you say Mikey, who are you referring to? The Mikey that got killed. I don't remember his last name for a sec. A bit later, during that same line of questioning, he suddenly remembers. What's strange is that considering Meldish is the main charge in this trial, how is that that so many people can't remember the guy's name? So at the time, Mikey and Mr. Caldwell were roommates? Yes, ma'am. And his last name was Meldish. I was just stuck for a second. Sorry about that. That's okay. Thank you, Mr. Spinelli. Since he was at the end of the day, there wasn't much more to ask him. However, there was a controversy brewing behind the scenes between the defense and prosecution regarding the next day's testimony. The government only wanted to play portions of Spinelli's recordings for the jury that he took while he was an active employee for the government the ones that would best fit their narrative, of course. In addition, those recordings weren't supposed to be viewed by the jury as truth, only what he said on the witness stand, which was his interpretation several years later of what he really meant at the time. Both parts of this are wrong. First, the government flip-flopped on the context issue several times throughout the trial. Sometimes they'd want to show everything, whether it was emails or recordings for context, and other times, such as this, they only wanted to play certain portions. Plus, the idea that someone can interpret what they really meant four years after the fact doesn't seem very fair. The government's reasoning was that when Spinelli made those recordings, he was playing a part, performing a role. Still, not only is that wrong, but even if you think that's reasonable, why not play the entire recording? Let Spinelli interpret it, and then let the jury decide the truth of the matter. That would seem like the most fair thing to do, right? Well, that's not how the government saw it. Sometimes the true story of what really happened is best told through the sidebars, as is the case when it comes to spineless Spinelli. I think the biggest question or issue is what the defense is permitted to do with recordings that Mr. Spinelli made that the government does not intend to offer, and, specifically, Mr. Spinelli's statements on those recordings. The court has been clear that Mr. Spinelli's words are not for the truth. He is acting at law enforcement's direction, and the jury should not credit what he says in those recordings.
Of course, his testimony here is different, but those recordings. We understand from conferring with at least counsel for Mr. Crea that they intend to point to Mr. Spinelli's statements and recordings as an attempt to impeach him. We don't think that's proper, and I haven't heard a compelling reason why they should be allowed to do that. Mr. De Pietro. So, essentially, Your Honor, what we had promised was, if the government is going to elicit Spinelli's opinion as to certain statements, for example, that Ditello says they just clipped somebody, and if the government is going to elicit that he believes that to be Stephen Crea, we feel that it's fair game to then elicit statements when he says Stevie had nothing to do with the murder, because it goes to the information that he's received informing his opinion. Mr. De Pietro. So essentially, Your Honor, what we had proposed was, if the government is going to elicit Spinelli's opinion as to certain statements, for example, that Ditello says they just clipped somebody, and if the government is going to elicit that he believes that to be Stephen Crea, we feel that it's fair game to then elicit statements when he says Stevie had nothing to do with the murder, because it goes to the information that he's receiving and forming his opinion. So we don't see why that wouldn't be fair game if he's going to testify that he has an opinion as to what certain statements mean, and the universe of what he's receiving should be fair game. If he's receiving information from Mafuchi, if he's receiving information from Vaughn, if he's receiving information that would lead him to say on tape, Stevie had nothing to do with this, it's not fair. It's misleading for him to come here and now say, oh, I took that one statement and that meant Stephen Crea. And the jury doesn't get to know that he is actually saying quite a few times that Stevie had nothing to do with the murder. So here in a nutshell is the answer. Because the government has a target, and his name is Stephen L. Crea, and anything that makes it look like he wasn't involved doesn't work for the government. They want their man, and no one is getting in their way. And the government doesn't play fair. The court. Let me just make sure I understand. He's going to testify. I gather, if he's not, maybe we don't have a problem. But if Spinelli's going to testify that when he heard Ditello say they just clipped a guy, it was his understanding that they included Mr. Crea. Mr. Scotton. Correct. The court. And your theory, Mr. DiPietro, is that his understanding has been informed by what he was hearing from other people, and therefore what? Mr. DiPietro. Well, it's also changed. It's changed over time. So he's going to come here in 2019 and say, oh, I thought I was that. That meant Stephen Crea based on the information I'm receiving. But when he's on tape in 2017 and 2016, he said, oh, I agree with you, Stevie had nothing to do with the murder. Mr. DiPietro. Okay, so also, there is a conversation between Mafuchi and Spinelli, and they're talking about who they believe to be involved in the murder. And when Stevie's name comes up, both of them unequivocally say Stevie had nothing to do with this. They have already shown that the Mafuchi is an alleged soldier. He has a basis of knowledge. He's communicating with all of these people. I just don't think it's fair if they get up there and Spinelli says, Oh, I believed it was Stephen Korea in 2019. And the jury has no clue that there's a tape recording out there before his testimony where it's not clear-cut. He's saying Stevie had nothing to do with it. So how could that not be a prior inconsistent statement from his testimony on the stand? Not just a recording date. But he's going to come in here and say, I believe that to be Steve Crea. Why should the jury be able to listen to who's allegedly in the family and who would be in the know when you already have someone like Spinelli? a guy with no standing and only known as Mike's brother, tell the jury that what he recorded himself saying four years ago isn't really what he meant. Makes sense, right? Not a chance. Surprisingly, Cybele agrees, at least for the moment. The court. Well, is he going to say anything more than, when I heard this from Ditello, I understood him to mean Steve Crea? Is he going to... I don't understand how he gets to express an opinion on the stand. Ms. Rothman. Your Honor is correct. He is going to interpret as he understood in that moment when Ditello said he clipped him who he understood that to be in reference to. Later statements and recordings. I mean, he's baiting witnesses. 
He's playing a pretend role. The court. And why can't he just say that? Ms. Rothman. Your Honor, I think it's... it's improper. I mean, if these statements are not offered for the truth, they can't properly be used to show that it is an inconsistent statement. He's baiting the witness again. Why is that okay? It's not. It's shady and should be illegal. The court. I'm not going to let the defense play the recordings. They can ask the witness, isn't it true that in the recording you made with such and such, you said Stevie had nothing to do with it? And he'll say yes, and then on redirect you'll say, why did you say that? And he'll say, because Agent Otto told me to get the guy in the conversation. But the government doesn't want that either, because that's just as shady, and prove the point, that Korea is a target. Cybelle was going to make her ruling the next day, but the prosecution wasn't done yet because they needed to take things out of context again when it came to Meldish's murder. Miss Rothman There is one additional issue which relates to a recording tomorrow. This is the conversation between Mr. Spinelli and Mr. Vaughn in which Mr. Vaughn says Meldish effed Maddie out of a lot of money and then Maddie told me to stay away from him. And then Vaughn goes on to opine that another family was responsible, which the court ruled was inadmissible. Last night we advised defense counsel that we only intend to offer the first statement from Mr. Vaughn, which is that Meldish effed Maddie out of a lot of money, and not the second statement that Maddie told me to stay away from him. The court. All right. And what is the part that the defense wants to offer? Mr. Jattel. The rest of the conversation, Your Honor. But, you know, he was around Maddie. We're talking about Meldish. He was best friends with Maddie. Then he fucked Maddie out of a lot of money. That's the government's theory. But on the next page, Mr. Vaughn says, But I don't think it was them, because I think it was another family's crew. But the other thing is also that at the end of it, see, he goes on and explains why he believes that because Meldish was on a construction site, and the other family sites without permission, or did things that were wrong, and the other family were upset with him. And then, at the very end, Mr. Vaughn explains why it's important that he, that Mr. Meldish and Maddie, Madonna, are not in good graces. It's because, because Mr. Madonna is no longer protecting him, and that's why the other family's crew was allowed to kill him. The court. So the statement is, yeah, when he was with Maddie, they all know Maddie's crew. You can't touch him. Once he fucked up with Maddie, plus he did a lot of bad. They were, they were bad kids. Mr. Jutel. Yes. The court. If the beginning of the conversation is a statement against interest because it shows that Mr. Vaughn is an insider, why isn't the rest of the conversation a statement against interest? Ms. Rothman. Your Honor, because it's blame-shifting. It's pointing the finger for the Meldish murder on someone else, the other family, as opposed to his own boss of the family. The Court. But the declarant isn't shifting blame off himself. He's not being accused of anything, so it's not... it's not blame-shifting. Miss Rothman. He's shifting it off someone he is very close with, Maddie Madonna, who he had a financial relationship with. He's shifting the blame away from someone he cares about to someone he doesn't care about, the other family. The court. Why would he say it if he didn't believe it? Ms. Rothman. Because he doesn't want to be the person spreading the word that Maddie Madonna ordered the hit on Michael Meldish, which is exactly what he insinuates in the second portion that we're not keeping in, that Maddie told me to stay away from him. Blame shifting. Didn't that come up with Pappas? And the government's theory is bogus. Why can't the prosecution just let the jury decide? Because the way they're presenting it, and what the whole context of the conversation is, are two very different things. The Court If I understand correctly, you're putting in the part where he says he screwed Maddie out of a lot of money, and you're not putting in the part where he says Maddie told me to stay away from him. If I understand the significance of that, that's Vaughn saying Maddie told me to stay away from Meldish because Maddie knew Meldish was going to get whacked, and he didn't want me to be around when that happened. Is that the significance of that comment? Miss Rothman. 
Maddie ordered him to be whacked, but sure. The court. Okay, so Maddie knew that Meldish was going to get whacked. Maddie's my buddy. Maddie doesn't want me around Meldish and get caught in the crossfire. So he's implicating Maddie at least two ways so far. And then you're leaving out the part where he says, but I think it was another family's crew. That doesn't seem fair. At least here, Cybele is thinking like a judge is supposed to think. But, as usual, she comes to her senses the next morning when she makes her ruling, at least when it comes to Spinelli and Mafucci. The court. So the government can ask the witness if he said, in his capacity as an informant, things he didn't believe, including that Stevie had nothing to do with it. The defense can ask the question if it doesn't come out on direct or it doesn't come out clearly. 613A doesn't require that the witness be confronted or be given, be shown the document, or be given the opportunity to explain. Before I admit any recording, those conditions must be met. But as I said yesterday, I don't expect the recording to be played. But when it came to Madonna and Vaughn, it's a completely different story. Ms. Rothman Part 1 is The Court Melda screwed Maddie out of a lot of money. Part two is, Maddie told me to stay away from Meldish. And part three is, I think another family crew did it. Mr. Patel, there's a bit more in the conversation, Your Honor. About the other family doing it? Vaughn, Spinelli asked him why he thinks another family did it. And, and Vaughn goes on to explain that Meldish was doing disrespect to that family. And then he says that the falling out with Maddie essentially left Meldish unprotected. So it's not just an accusation that the other family did it. It's an explanation of Meldish's behavior and his relationship, or his deterioration of his relationship, with Mr. Madonna that results in the other family being able to hurt Meldish. The court. I have to agree with the government on this, so that's going to stay out. So the jury isn't going to see the whole picture. If you remember, there was an issue with calling Otto to the stand to ask him about why he didn't follow up on the other families who might have been involved in Meldish's murder. That never happened, so Seibel's decision on this fits with what she did earlier. Wouldn't want the truth to come out. When Spinelli took the stand, he boasted about some odd things, including how he was roomed with the Vic Amuso at Big Sandy, Kentucky just one year before Spinelli was to be released from his sentence for the attempted murder of Capazzalo. As it always is with these informants, Amuso reportedly told him all about the Lucchese family operations, including who was acting boss and underboss. By the way, Spinelli had asked his counselor to be roomed with Amuso, so that's how he found out all this information. And just to keep with the theme of Spinelli's fascination with Stevie, Here's the first time he mentions his name. Did Amuso also tell you who was the underboss of the Lucchese family? Yes. Who was that? Stevie Creo. Stevie. Just like he knew him personally. The next day, the government knew it was going to look like the shady enterprise it was when Spinelli continued his day on the stand and they wanted Cybele to read a jury instruction that the government is not on trial. It's usually something that's read at the end of informant testimony, but the government wanted it read before. Cybele decided to do it only if it warranted, and at some point, it was going to be warranted. However, Scotton had something to say about it, because he was starting to feel attacked by the defense's questioning of his informant witnesses. He seems to think that if the jury gets the instruction, then it'll open their eyes as to why what happened needed to happen, and also help the government not look so shady. Cybele then explained to Scotton how she understood exactly how he felt. The court. Well, I will wait and see what happens. I will tell you, I remember what it's like to sit where you're sitting, and when those sorts of accusations are made, they loom large because they're personal, and they always outrage me too. But I will tell you, they do not land the way you're worried that they land. The percentage of the cross on the topic is, from where I'm sitting, in the middle, very small, and I don't think the impact is 
from where I sit as a neutral person nearly what it feels like to you as the person on the receiving end of the implicit accusation in the question. Thanks, Mom. But also, she forgets. She's not really neutral in this. There was another concern, by De Pietro, about Spinelli's recordings when it came to the subject of Sean Richard. Mr. De Pietro, Your Honor already ruled on this, so I'm just, for record purposes, that we just maintain our objection. The government intends on eliciting about the Sean Richard attempt in 2016, and they're also going to be playing some recordings. Your Honor ruled them in as a declaration against penal interest for Ditello. But I do think this line of inquiry should be limited, because it's pretty clear that Crea had nothing to do with this, or any of the trial defendants, and it's misleading to the jury, and it's prejudicial to make them think that, and especially in light of the government's claim yesterday that Spinelli is lying and just interjecting things, that any of these people on trial were involved in this 2016 plan to kill Sean Richard, and it's highly prejudicial. So we would just maintain our objection. Your Honor did rule it in, though, at the time, but at that time, the new indictment had not come down. And also, when I reached out to the government last night, they explained to me that it's absurdly late. But I'm just maintaining the objection, not saying that, you know, just for the record, we are not waiving that this should not come in. Then it was time for Spinelli to take the stand again. Right before Spinelli was released from Big Sandy, Amuso had given him a job. And this job is what led Spinelli to his disdain for Madonna. Apparently, Amuso wanted Spinelli to deliver a letter to Madonna to extort $4 million from Sal Avellino, a former alleged Lucchese family capo who had apparently been shelved, with the premise that if he wanted to be reactivated, he'd need to cough up the money. Plus, Amuso apparently told Madonna that Spinelli was to be made. But the most surprising thing about this all was that Amuso was going to let Spinelli keep half the money. Two million dollars as a reward for his role in the attempted Capazalo hit. You know, the one where he was only the switch car driver a mile away. Amuso's wife was to get one million dollars and Madonna the other million. When Madonna told him to forget about Avellino and get a job because he was out on parole, Spinelli was incensed. Spinelli also didn't like the idea that his job wasn't going to be with the union he had worked for previously, but one that Brian Vaughn was involved with. Then he heard from someone that Evelino was reinstated, which infuriated him even more, because he figured that Evelino paid the money and he didn't get his part. Plus, Spinelli had never been made. And that's the basis of why he hated Matthew Madonna and made him his target when he became a rat. He also talked about how he stole some pot from a Bonanno guy named Guido, and he was called out on it by Big John Castellucci, who told him Matty said he had to pay the money back. But Spinelli laughed in Castellucci's face, and this interaction also gives us insight into Spinelli's state of mind. What did he say about the debt? He told me I had to pay the loan back. How did you respond? I told him it wasn't a loan. What did you mean by that? I told him I robbed Guido. Later he got a call from Meldish that he had bought the loan. Soon after I got a call from Michael Meldish. Had you met Meldish before? No, I hadn't. What did Meldish tell you? He called me on the phone and he told me he bought the loan. How did you respond? I laughed at him. Why did you laugh? I just, I told him, like, this is a joke. What do you mean, it's a joke? You want me to pay back something that I robbed the guy. Spinelli discussed how he made between 200 to 300 recordings between 2012 and 2017 and explained a bit about why he did what he did, and it just makes us dislike him even more. Why is it that the FBI relies on total scumbags, and in this case a complete mentally defective one, to do their job for them? When you started working with the FBI, were you going to be investigating people who were not associated with the mob? No. Okay. Generally, through your work, what were you hoping to do? Gather information. Gather information about what? About extortion, drugs, murder. 
Any other crimes? Robbery. Everything that the mob was involved with. Okay. Now, if the recordings... And you made recordings, Mr. Spinelli. Yes, I have. If the recordings you made were just of you talking, would that have been helpful to the FBI? Absolutely not. Why not? Because I wouldn't be giving them no information. So what did you try to do when you worked for the FBI? Gather as much information as I can. And how would you do that? By recording people, going out, meeting people. During the recordings, would you sometimes say things that weren't true? Yes, I did. Why would you do that? To entice them to tell me things. Okay, and how would saying false things help you gather information? Because they would tell me, Oh, no, you're wrong about that. This is the way that happened. And somehow, this is an acceptable method of operation? From a guy who obviously has a vendetta, who is more than willing to do the FBI's bidding, because they share a common goal of getting somebody. Later, Spinelli starts talking about Detello and how that related to Stevie. What Rothman is bringing up here is the recording where Spinelli forgot to turn off his tape recorder. Again, the tone of this guy. Okay, I now want to talk about a recording from August 2014 involving Joseph Detello. Let me first ask you, a few background questions. How did you get connected to Detello when you were working for the FBI? Through Jimmy. Through Jimmy Mafucci? Yes. And between 2013 and 2017, what were you and Detello doing together? Selling drugs. And you were doing these deals at the FBI's request? Yes. Do you know why Detello was engaging in this drug dealing? Yes. Why? Because he was desperate. He had to pay Stevie back money, a loan that he had with Stevie. That's Stevie Crea. Yes. Of course, he fails to mention these drug deals were set up by Spinelli and Pete. But it's good that he admits the reason why they felt Detello was the perfect guy to help them get closer to the main guy. Spinelli goes on to talk about Sean Richard in depth despite the fact that the charge of attempted murder against Richard had been dropped in the new indictment. So the only purpose of bringing that information into this trial was to paint Crea as the bad guy the government wanted the jury to think he was. We'll get more into that when we get into the defense side of things. For now, let's see what Spinelli has to say about the Meldish murder. When Detello says, I mean this guy, this guy just clipped a guy because of $100,000. Who do you understand this guy to be in reference to? At that point, I, I believed it to be Stevie Crea. Why do you believe that? Because he said this guy. He was going to see him directly, and I know he wasn't seeing Maddie. He told me he wasn't seeing Maddie. Now, based on your involvement in Costa Nostra, where would the order to have killed Meldish come from? Manny Madonna first. And then when you say, I know, I know it wasn't House, and Detello responds, yeah, what do you understand Detello to be acknowledging? Acknowledging that in-house killed Meldish themselves. It wasn't outsiders, it was among us. Meaning the Lucchese's. Meaning the Lucchese family, yes. So, Mr. Spinelli, I had asked you, I had begun to ask you, when Detello says, they clipped Meldish, who do you understand that to be in reference to? Maddie Madonna. Anyone else? Stevie Crea. And the government continues to paint its dirty picture of Crea. Later, Spinelli goes into Detello's supposed other financial troubles, saying that he owed money to people in other families as well, but that at least one other family reduced his debt. But Crea never did. And as you understand Detello telling you, what did the other family do with respect to Detello's debt? They told him if he... They cut it in half because he came home from jail. Did Stevie ever agree to reduce Detello's debt? Absolutely not. The court. That you heard of. Did you hear, ever hear anything about that? Yes. He told me that Stevie wouldn't take a dollar off. 
He wanted every dollar he owed him. He then gives his interpretation of a statement, claiming that Londonio was made after Meldish was killed, something that would be completely contradicted later. Also, something to consider is this particular recording wasn't played for the jury. It was taken off a government-produced transcript. The court. Again, this is, this is what the... What the witness says is not evidence, but you may consider what the witness says to interpret Mr. Ditello's response. Ms. Rothman, thank you, Your Honor. And so after you say, Mr. Spinelli, they were like good friends, and Ditello responds, yeah, yeah, we were very close. Who do you understand Ditello to be saying was very close? Michael Meldish and the kid, Chris Landonio. And now turning to the next page, when you say Jimmy said supposedly right after that happened, the kid Chris got made like the next day. And the teller responds, yeah, what do you understand the teller to be acknowledging? That right after that happened, Maddie made that kid a made member of the family. And that's Chris. Right. Chris, yes. Getting back to Stevie. So, Mr. Spinelli, you testified that, to your knowledge, Ditello gave the money that he earned from these drug deals to Steve Crea, correct? Yes. Where would he go to pay him? To the club in the Bronx. How often would he go? He had to go every month. How would he know when to go? He got the phone call. How frequently would you and Ditello discuss the money that Stevie, the money that Ditello owed to Stevie? A few, a few days a week. He constantly complained about it because it kept him broke. He had nothing because of it. And more. When Ditello says, Listen, Stevie, Stevie, he don't want to know nothing about nobody. You know he just wants to know one thing about me. What do you understand Ditello to be saying there? What day are you bringing my money every month? What's happening here is Rothman is playing select recordings, shotgun style, for Spinelli to give his interpretation. There is no context, just as the government wanted, to show the whole gist of the conversation. It's hard to follow along, so imagine if you're the jury who just had to hear what was happening. When the tello says, I wouldn't go against that guy for nothing, who do you understand him to be referring to? I understand it to be Stevie. And then he says, he goes on, he's a boss. I don't go against bosses. Their decision is their decision. Who is he referring to? He could refer to Maddie. Mr. Patel. Objection. The court. What was your understanding at the time? And if you don't know, just say you don't know. On, on the first part, I understood it to be Stevie. On the second part, I understand that to be Maddie. So what have you asked Ditello to do in this portion, Mr. Spinelli? And it may be easier to look back on page 26 when you say, I'd like you to say something to Stevie a little, just to see what he says. What did you ask Ditello to do? Just to basically put me on record with him. Okay, and then turning to the next page when you say, I mean, he's equal to the other guy, like, you know, he ain't under nobody. And Ditello responds, yeah, but he ain't gonna, he ain't gonna go against him. When Ditello says he's equal to the other guy, who is Ditello referring to there? Him and Maddie being equal to each other. And him is in reference to who? Stevie Crea. Now on the next page, when Ditello says, because that guy wouldn't go against his wishes, what's he thinking? So they're not going to go against one another. This is on page 28. What do you understand Ditello to be saying there? They're not going to... Stevie is not going to go against Maddie for anybody. And then Spinelli goes on and on about Ditello's debt to Stevie, and they finally get to Sean Richard and that bogus Facebook scheme that he and Secret Agent Pete dreamt up. And remember, the Sean Richard charge is off the table. So think about why this is being presented at all. But mostly, think about how the government thinks it's okay to set a guy up for murder, even though he doesn't admit that they're the ones who sent Ditello the Facebook message. All right, the last set of recordings I want to discuss with you, Mr. Spinelli, relate to Stephen Crea, Joe Ditello, and the attempted murder of Sean Richard. In 2017, 
Did you learn from the FBI about an attempt to kill Sean Richard? Yes, I did. Who committed the attempt? Joe Dutello. The court. I'm sorry. This is something the witness learned from the FBI? Your Honor, we're offering it as background, not to explain what sets up this recording, not for the truth. The court. Anything that the witness was told by the FBI is not evidence. I learned from the FBI that Joe Ditello had found his witness from his previous case. So, in this case, what the FBI says isn't the truth? That's funny. Who was that witness? Sean Richards. Okay. We previously discussed him, correct? Yes. What did the FBI want you to do in connection with that information? They wanted me to gather information to find out what his approach was. What he wanted to do, was he going to attempt to kill him? Okay, so what did you do to get this information from Joe, Mr. Ditello? I made up a story. I had a scenario. I had a witness who testified against me in my trial. And I told him that my witness was upstate New York. That he had a Christmas tree farm. He was selling a lot of Christmas trees up there. And Pete located him for me and found out. And that I was going up there and kill him. So I told Joe. Jimmy told me that you had a situation where you found the guy who ratted you out on your previous case. Now, was it true that someone had cooperated against you in the trial involving Patricia Capazzalo? Yes. Was it true that you were planning to go attempt to kill that individual? No, it was not. Okay. Now, as part of your work for the FBI, what were you trying to uncover specifically about the plan to kill Sean Richard? I wanted to find out if Joe was going to kill him, and I wanted to find out if Stevie was part of it. Was part of it? Yes. Now, as you listen to this next part, think back to the pre-trial hearings when the Sean Richard attempted murder charges was on the original indictment, and how Stephen D. was denied bail because of these recordings. And think about what the government said then compared to what it said now. How does that change so drastically? They fought against Bale so vehemently, and then, when Cy Bell gave them their do-over, the charge disappeared into the government's black hole. Remember, too, that this is when Crea's counsel wanted to inspect the grand jury minutes and was denied. So, based on the following testimony, doesn't it make you wonder that maybe the evidence that was presented to the grand jury to bring that original indictment was false? And if so... Could that mean that other supposed evidence the government had was all a lie, too? Now, were you successful in finding out if Stevie Crea had approved the hit on Sean Richard? No, I was not. So, what do you mean you were not successful? Joe didn't tell me that Stevie ordered him to do that. What did Joe tell you in these recordings? Joe said that Stevie said, basically, leave it alone. And then, back to Londonio and those idiotic rat rumors, just so the government can justify their theories about Londonio's confession to Evangelista later on. This recording, by the way, was taken March 22, 2017, after Londonio had already been arrested and indicted for Meldish's murder and was dealing with the additional bogus informant rumors the government leaked to the press. And when you say that the... This is line 390, that the kid, Chris, was under his son, and Detello says, yeah, I think so, who, when you say under his son, who are you referring to? It was under Stevie's son. We can keep playing. Pause it right there. When you say in line 385, if he goes bad, can he hurt Maddie? And Detello responds, he could hurt everybody. Who is the he in reference to? Chris Londonio. And then he talks a bit about his vendetta against Maddie. Mr. Spinelli, when you first sat down with the FBI in 2012, were you facing any state charges? State charges I had. What were they for? Aggravated assault of a police officer? Tell us what happened. I left my house and I was a passenger in a vehicle and the cops pulled us over and the cop went to my side to pull me out of the car. We had a little scuffle, and, and what happened? Was the police officer injured? Yes. Did you attempt to resist arrest? Yes, I did. 
Please go back to our Robert Spinelli background and see for yourself how much the government allowed him to lie in this specific instance. It wasn't a scuffle, and the cops only pulled him out after he tried to flee, and so, so much more. What type of sentence were you looking at in connection with those? How many years were you looking at in connection with those state charges? Four years. At that time, did you want to go back to jail? No. So what did you decide to do? I tried to cooperate. Okay, and specifically, withdrawn, was there any other reason that you agreed to cooperate at that time? I wanted to get Maddie back. And there you have it. The FBI probably had a little party when Spinelli walked through their doors. Nothing like a guy with a vendetta to help their cause. And it's pretty sick, too. What a way to waste taxpayer dollars. Also, even though Spinelli gives us the reason why he wants to get back at Madonna, do they really think that justifies their actions? Does it really mean anything when Spinelli said he had no issues with any of the other guys on trial except Madonna? Does the government think that washes away the shadiness of it all? Quite frankly, after just this short amount of testimony from this guy, the government should put itself on trial. Here's the rest of that testimony. Why did you want to get Maddie back? Because of him not fulfilling the agreement he was supposed to fulfill when I got out of jail. What was that agreement? He was supposed to give me two million dollars after he made Sally active again. Now, at that time when you sat down with the FBI, were you mad at someone named Chris Londonio? I didn't even know Chris Londonio. Were you mad at someone named Terence Caldwell? I didn't even know him either. Were you mad at someone named Stevie Crea? No, I was not. Did you make recordings only about Matthew Madonna or about all members of the Lucchese family? I made recordings about all members of the Lucchese family. Finally, Spinelli and the government were done with spinning their tails, and it was the defense's turn to unravel the lies. They mostly focused on Spinelli's lies and deceit while working for the FBI, which we detailed in our spineless Spinelli background section, but there's something we'd like to highlight that Marengolo brought up during his cross. Okay, and I believe in the witness security program. There's, there's federal agents, correct? Yes. Like marshals, right? Yes. And you're not supposed to lie to them, right? Absolutely not. Okay, isn't it a fact that you lied to them about your wife using heroin? No, I did not. Okay. Well, you were in the witness security program. Did you provide heroin to your wife? No. Ms. Rothman. Objection, Your Honor. Absolutely not. Maybe something will refresh your recollection. The court. He hasn't said he forgot. He said no. He said no? So you didn't lie to the marshals and say that you did not provide your wife with heroin and that you did provide your wife with heroin. You don't recall that? I don't. Sustained as to form. Try it again, Mr. Maringolo. Okay. Did you ever tell, eventually tell, the marshals that you were providing your wife with heroin? No, I don't remember that. I can't recall that. The government once again getting nervous about their lying witness. It seems Spineless Spinelli got a little twisted in the wind, with even more twisted tales unraveled by Maringolo. Maybe something will refresh your recollection. Okay, you can read the entire document, but I'm going to point you to the highlighted section. Ms. Rothman, Your Honor, I said that she did not, that I did not provide her with heroin. The question is, now you've read that, does that jog your memory? Yeah, I never said that. I never. It, it don't say that I said that. Okay, okay. While you were in the witness security program, did you ever... You saw doctors to get prescriptions filled, correct? While I'm in the witness protection program? Yeah. I never, I never received medicine while I'm in the witness protection program. What are you referring to? I never received heroin for a doctor while in the witness protection. What about any other medications? Only thing I received would be Suboxone for a few months. Little big man finally getting knocked back down to size, slapped with a little reality, so to speak. Okay. But didn't you testify that you, you believed that Vic gave you the approval to get made? 
Yes, I did. And that was another letter, right? That was a letter that I took out. Right. And you read that letter, right? That's right. And, and the letter, you gave it to Mr. Madonna? Yes, I did. And that was from Vicar Musso. That's right. And Vicar Musso said that you were supposed to get made? That's right. And you didn't get made? Right? No, I did not. Okay. And when did you give Mr. Madonna this letter? About two weeks after I got in the halfway house. Two weeks after you got... Were you caught on surveillance with Mr. Madonna? Not that I know of. Okay. Did the government ever show you surveillance with you and Mr. Madonna? No, they did not. Now getting to Spinelli's second favorite subject. Actually, he has more affection for Stevie than he wants to admit. Okay. Now, you also testified against Mr. Crea many times here, right? I spoke about Mr. Crea. I mean, there were... We are not going to go into the tapes, but there was about 20 to 30 references to Mr. Crea that you analyzed, right? Yes. And you knew... Did you ever speak to a guy by the name of John Panisi? John Panisi? I, I may have. You may have, right? Okay. And you said that you were talking about Mr. Crea in his capacity as underboss in 2017, right? That's right. Okay. Did anybody from the FBI tell you that that just wasn't true, sir? Ms. Rothman. Objection, Your Honor. The court. I'm sorry, that, Mr. Maringolo. All right, withdrawn. The court. What the witness may or may not have told the FBI. Nothing more than hearsay and manipulation of the truth. Okay, so it's your, it's your testimony that in 2017, when you were just analyzing all these tapes, Mr. Crea was the underboss. That's your testimony, right? As far as I knew. Okay, but in fact, you really didn't know much but for talking to Joe Ditello, right? That's what I, I knew from Joe Ditello talking about it. You know, I mean, listen, you were talking to Joe Ditello for three years, right? Yes. Right. And you... A lot of gossip in those calls, or those consensuals, right? Objection, Your Honor. If the witness agrees with the characterization, he'll say so. If he doesn't, he'll... I wouldn't say gossip. I would say he was pretty nervous. I was worried about him every time he went up there to see him. The whole time you were worried about him, right? 2015, 2016, 2017, right? I was starting to worry about him. Right, okay. And he never had a scratch on his body, correct? No. Okay. And you knew Mr. Ditello. He was like a brookster, right? Ms. Rothman. Objection, Your Honor. The court. He was a what? Mr. Maringolo. Brookster. He was broke, right? He was broke. The court. Oh, he was broke. Okay. Depends on where you grow up, right? That's our jargon. But you understand me, right, Mr. Spinelli? Yes. The court. All right. You got to bring the rest of us along. Sorry. You knew he was broke, right? I seen that, yes. Right. From the first conversation with him, you knew he was broke, right? Yes. And I think even in the first conversation, if you recall, he didn't even have a few hundred dollars, right? No, he didn't. Okay. And then you came along with these cigarettes, right? Correct? That's correct. And that was supplied by the government? Yes. The ones that you kicked up an extra few dollars for yourself, right? That's right. Okay. And then he started to make a few dollars, right? That's right. And then originally, he didn't even want to sell cocaine, right? He... I don't believe he had too many customers. Okay. But he had a person to get it from. Right. And nobody to sell it to. But he... he didn't want to do it, correct? I wouldn't say that. He wanted to do whatever he can to pay Stevie back. Well, didn't one of the conversations, and we're not going in, didn't he say, it's not worth it to get a life sentence to make a thousand dollars? Do you remember that conversation that you... I remember that recently, that conversation, yes. Okay. And he... was he lying to you? He was joking about that, referring to talking on the phone and getting busted to make a thousand dollars, you know. Right, he was. But that was a consensual recording. 
You were recording him. Right. 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 So he didn't think you were wearing a wire, right? Absolutely not. Okay. So he said, I don't want to do life for a thousand dollars, right? He's telling me to be careful because he doesn't want to go to jail for a thousand dollars. Exactly. But he was just, he was trying to make a living, right? He was trying to pay Stevie back. Well, but he was just trying to make, he had never paid Stevie back for, for ten years. And then you're all worried about him? Do you know that? Cocky ass bastard. Do you know that? Are you serious? And then Super Agent Ted Otto exposed. Well, when he's talking to you in 2014, okay, about a supposed debt that was from the 90s, correct? Before they went to jail, right? Right. So in 2017, in the late 90s, that's about, that's about 18 years, correct? Yes. And there wasn't one hair removed from his body, right? That's right. Okay. But did you, you were playing a role there, right? That's right. And every time you went out to talk about Stevie and Maddie, you talked to Ted Otto, right? Yes. Okay. And you, you had some sort of script, right? I wouldn't say a script. I wouldn't say it was a script. Okay. You would say you were prepared, right, for the conversation, for things that may come up, may not come up. I was, I was on my, I mean, I was on my game. Okay. You were on your game, right? Yeah, that's true. Okay. And you know that my client, Mr. Londonio, was charged with the Meldish murder in 2013, correct? I found out. Ms. Rothman, objection, the court, overruled, and there were times during your conversations that you would inject, you would inject things about the Meldish murder, correct? Inject statements about the Meldish murder, right? I may have. Okay, you have no first-hand knowledge of what happened, right? No, I do not. Okay, and neither does Mr. Detello, right? Ms. Rothman, objection, Your Honor, to your knowledge, the court. Did he ever indicate to you that he had first-hand knowledge of who killed Mr. Meldish? He told me that Chris killed him. Did he say whether he had first-hand knowledge? No, he did not say, I have first-hand knowledge. He didn't say those words, no. Think of all the money spent on this guy. New cars, cashmere sweater, new phones, tax-free salary, just so they can get their target. Taxpayer dollars spent on trash. You met with Mr. Madonna. He told you to get a job, right? That's what he said to me. Okay. He gave me Brian Vaughn's number. He told me that he'll put you to work at Local 20. I told him I wanted to go back to my local, and he said, Brian will help you do that. And that's what he did. Okay. But he told you to go work. He didn't tell you to be a gangster, right? He told me to just go to work when he, go to work, right? Go to work. And you didn't. You didn't like that, right? You didn't want to go to work. Well, we had, I gave him a letter. Did you want to go to work? The court. Mr. Spinelli, finish your answer, and then it will be Mr. Maringolo's turn. I gave him the letter. Told me he'll see me in a few weeks. He told me to reach out to Brian. That is what I did. Told me... He'll put you to work back with your local, and he will be in touch. That's what he told me. Hearsay and rumors. That's all the government's got so far. Okay, isn't it true that you testified or not testified? Isn't it true that you debriefed that Mr. Londonio got made right after the murder? I was told that. Okay, who told you that? Jimmy Mafucci and Joe Ditello. Okay. So Jimmy Mafucci and Joe Ditello told you that my client got made right after the murder, right? Within the next week is what they, within the next week, right? That's what they said. And that was that. For that day at least. The following day on October 18th, 2019, Gangland's exclusive story about Londonio's bogus escape from a 10-page detailed report he got from the FBI and which Gangland had posted about made headlines across the country. 
But it was a story that appeared in one New York paper that caused the most concern for the defense. The entire defense team asked a mistrial, which, of course, Cybell denied. But what needs to be highlighted is Scotton's reaction to that nasty and unnecessary article and the sidebar before the jury came into the courtroom. Mr. Scotton, I just want to make clear that, make clear, after the defendants were all asked if they wanted any redactions for a bunch of defendants who had all opposed everything the government is trying to do to say, hey, there's media attention here. So I don't think the court should be indulgent of their efforts to get a redo on the trial, which is where they seem to want to head with a post story that they all wanted. The court. Well, Mr. Freeman, Your Honor, that's, that's a little, I don't know, a little bit, if they, extreme. I don't know. It's not a little extreme makes me think that perhaps Scotton was in on the leak of that report to gangland. Crea's attorney, Franklin, questioned Spinelli about the debt Ditello owed to Crea, and Spinelli was forced to admit the same things he said to Moringolo the day before, that despite the alleged amount, Crea never harmed a hair on Ditello's head. Spinelli even testified that when he was a Shylock, and if someone owed him that kind of money, Whoever the debtor was would probably have had some sort of repercussions for not making good on his payments. But if nothing like that ever happened to Ditello, even after eight years, if I was a juror, what I would have gotten out of all that testimony was that Creo wasn't this evil villain the government tried to make him out to be, but more like what Ditello said in that one recording the government misrepresented. We talked about towards the beginning of this article, that Creo was a pretty good guy. And while we're not going to get into all of Spinelli's other testimony this day, we did want to share this little ditty from Rothman's redirect. Do you remember being asked on cross-examination today by Mr. Franklin about you putting, attempting to get Stevie and Maddie's name out of Joe Ditello? That's correct. Who's, as part of your work for the FBI, what were you trying to do, Mr. Spinelli? I was trying to get all information about Lucchese members. And to your knowledge, are Mr. Madonna and Mr. Crea members of the Lucchese crime family? To my knowledge. If you can just back up a bit. To my knowledge, they are the boss and the underboss of the Lucchese crime family. Do you recall also being asked on cross-examination by Mr. Franklin if you had ever met Stevie Crea, correct? Correct. Based on your involvement in the Lucchese crime family, what do you understand to be the reason that you never met Steve Crea? Because Steve Crea is an underboss. And what about that fact makes it unlikely that you personally would have met Stevie Crea? That's correct. I'm sorry, I'll... What about that makes it unlikely that you would have met Stevie Crea? Mr. Franklin. Objection, Your Honor, as to his opinion. Court. Overruled because I was not a made member. In your experience, do underbosses of organized crime families typically meet with non-made members or associates of those families? Not usually, no. So what was the purpose of Spinelli always trying to get a meeting with Stevie? If this was the tactic the government tried to use to slap back at the defense, I call it stupid meeting stupid. And that's the end of that tall tale. And basically, nothing learned. Once again, about the murder of Michael Meldish.